So 1 Peter 2, we'll begin in verse 12, and we'll look just at verse 12 for now. 1 Peter 2, 12, this is God's word, eternally true. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Now go down to verse 15. Verse 15. For it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant, ignorant talk of foolish men. Now down to verse 20, chapter 2, verse 20. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. Now down to our sermon text proper this morning, uh, chapter 3, beginning in verse uh, 13, and we'll be looking primarily at, at the end of 14, but um, and on through verse 18. Uh, but for context, we'll start with verse 13. 1 Peter 3, 13. Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear. Do not be frightened. But in your heart set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope, the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience, so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. It is better if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. For Christ died for sins, once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit. Here ends our reading, the word of the Lord. Uh, when I was uh, growing up in uh, Delaware, Ohio, from 6th grade through 12th grade, I had a friend, his name was Scott Everhart. I did have a friend, believe it or not, right? Um, and uh, one of my friends, his name was Scott Everhart, and, and uh, Scott, uh, looking at him, you wouldn't guess he was an avid basketball player, but he was, and, and he was quite good, and he played and played and played, and through the summer, he, you'd go over to his house, and he wouldn't be there, and his mom would say, oh, he's over at the high school playing basketball, and you'd go over there, and he would be playing basketball on the, on the outdoor basketball courts with whoever was there playing pickup games. And Scott would be all over at different courts around town playing basketball. Um, and the reason for that is because Scott hoped to one day play Division I basketball, big time college basketball somewhere. And that affected what he was doing as a, as a sixth grader and seventh and eighth grader as a 10th grader. And Scott even got made fun of a little bit because he was always playing basketball. Uh, but Scott had this goal. He had a, a future uh, place in mind to be uh, playing Division I basketball, and that affected his life then, today, even before he got to college age. As we look at this passage here, it talks to us about how our future destination, how our hope, not for playing Division I basketball, but our hope of eternal life through Jesus affects how we live our lives today. If you'd like to fill out blanks in an outline, you can um, do that now. If you want to just listen, if that's uh, more effective for you, you can do that as well. But um, as we've been talking about over the, over the past number of weeks, and as Peter keeps coming back to during this book, this letter, 1 Peter, the idea of one's conduct, the conduct of a Christian, is a crucial idea in 1 Peter, and it's a term that comes up over and over in various synonyms about our, our conduct. And as we looked at last week and some weeks before, too, uh, God has this for us. And your first point there in your outline is this. Do good, 
do good, that is, do what is good, though you might suffer for it. Do good, though you might suffer for it. If you look back there at chapter 2, verses 12, 15, and 20, chapter 2, verses 12, 15, and 20, um, you, you see there that it's God's will for you to do good. And you see that phrase over and over again, live such good lives, verse 12. Verse 15, by doing good, you see that again there. And then uh, verse 20, uh, second sentence, but if you suffer for doing good, God says over and over to us again that we are to be people who are doing good, to be doing what's good. In other words, in, in contrast to generally what's said in American evangelicalism today, where you believe in Jesus and you don't worry about what's good, you don't worry about the commands of Scripture, Scripture itself says no. We're to be concerned about doing what's good and doing what's right. We're to always be concerned about that, even if there are consequences to it. And so verse 17 here in our our uh, sermon text here. It is better if it is God's will to suffer for doing good. Sometimes it's God's will that as we do good, we suffer for it. We won't always suffer for doing good. Sometimes you'll do good and you'll get a pat on the back, and that's, that's nice. But verse 17 there, look, if it is God's will, sometimes we suffer for doing good. And we're to suffer for doing good instead of for doing what's evil. So by this, by, by doing good, and as you do good, and as this suffering happens, next line there for you in your outline, you'll reflect or you'll be like Jesus. God wants us to know that too. When you do good, when you do what's good, when you do what's right, and you suffer for it, you're being like Jesus. You're reflecting Jesus. If you look there in verse 18, look there. For Christ died for sins once for all. This is not an arbitrary mention of the gospel, that Christ died for your sins. This is Peter making a point. Christ, who did good, suffered for it. He did good, and he died as if he had sinned. Because he was bearing our sins in his body on the cross. 1 Peter 2, 24. You look there. He bore our sins in his body. And so when we do good and suffer for it, we're like Jesus because he did good. Look at verses 22 and 23 there in chapter 2. He committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. But, chapter 3, verse 18, Christ died for sins. He suffered, though he did what was good. And so when we do what was good, or what is good, and we suffer for it, we're just being like Jesus. That's what happens in this world. You do good, and sometimes it's God's will that you suffer for it. Isaiah 53, right? For it is God's will that he was smitten for his sins. It was God's will that he suffered for us. Now, that's a, that's a tough task. Um, we're told to do good, and we'd like it to say, and everything will go well for you. We talked about that a bunch last week, and that's what Job's friend said. You know, Job, you must have done bad because things aren't going well for you. But Job is living out, a, a, he's a shadow of what Jesus would do. Job does good, and he suffers for it. Because he does so much good, the Lord can trust him, even when he's suffering, to be faithful. And so Jesus does good, and he's faithful to the Lord, and he suffers for it. And so we're asked to be like Jesus. Do good, even though you know you may suffer for it. And you know from the time you were a kid, and if you're a kid now, you know it's your existence now, but you know it's your existence now, you're just kind of used to it if you're an adult, that if you do certain things that are good, people will look at you like you're weird, or they'll make fun of you. They'll ostracize you. They won't include you in their, their group because you're out for what's, what's good. Oh, why are you doing that? But we're called to do good, even though that may come, even though that may come to us. Now, how can we do that? 
How can we do good knowing that doing good may bring us, may bring us suffering? There are four things we're going to talk about, four, four ways um, that help us, four things that are true. Um, that's your number two, how, can, how you can do this. How you can do good with the knowledge that this doing good may cause you to suffer. There are four things that will help you. First thing is your A, B, C, and D here. First thing that will help you to do good even though you may suffer for it. A, by practicing keeping a clear conscience as you live each day. Conscience is a funny word, isn't it? It's con science. If you want to know how to spell conscience, spell science and put a con in front of it. That's just an interesting etymology of a word. Uh, but uh, conscience, by practicing keeping, keeping a clear conscience as you live each day. And you see in verse 16, chapter 3, verse 16, it says this, that we are to, verse 16, keeping a clear conscience. So how do we do this? How do we do what's good, even though we may suffer for it? Well, we, we need to be keeping a clear conscience. So first of all, what is a conscience? What is that? How can we define conscience? That's your next point here, your number one. What is the conscience? It's this. God has placed inside you, in your soul, an internal alarm that goes off to warn you part of who you are. That's how he constructs human beings. It's part of the, the frame of each individual. That he gives each individual a conscience. Non-believers, believers. It's part of the, the image of God. We have on us a conscience. Again, that conscience is an internal alarm that goes off to warn us in the face of wrong not to do it. Okay? So if you've got a temptation in front of you, you've got something in front of you, and you know if, if that it's wrong, your conscience starts going off like this. Boop, 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 and you feel uncomfortable. And we all know that feeling inside. That's our conscience, and it's warning us. It's, it's the, the alarm's going off, our internal alarm, and it's saying, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that. That's our conscience, and God has given us a conscience to help us. To be faithful to him. To help us to love others well. So it warns us in the face of wrong not to do it. And then if we disobey our conscience, if we do it anyway, next part of that sentence, then it gives you guilt feelings after you've done wrong. So we have the common expression in addition to having a clear conscience, we have the expression, I have a guilty conscience. Or you see somebody and they're kind of head down, or, or they, they're looking a little bit sheepish, we say, well, he has a guilty conscience about what he did. It's because he saw wrong, or she saw wrong, and, and he did that, and then the conscience within each person makes that person feel guilty about that. And when that thing gets brought up, they feel guilty, and they hope no one asks them about it. Did you do that? Who took my sandwich out of the refrigerator? <laughs> our alarm goes off. We saw that sandwich and we knew it wasn't ours and it was wrapped and it looked like, well, I know I hadn't made it and probably someone else needs that for their lunch. Probably someone else is looking forward to that and my conscience is going off. Don't take that, don't take that, don't take that even though you're hungry. And I eat it anyway. Okay, so I don't obey my conscience. I eat it anyway and then I feel guilty about eating it. And while I'm eating it, if someone, if I hear someone coming into the room, I may even hide the, <laughs> hide the sandwich. Or if someone comes in later and says, hey, who took my sandwich? We're hoping they don't look over to us and say, David, did you take my sandwich? Because our conscience, our internal alarm is, is, is making us feel, feel guilty about the wrong we've done. And then the third thing the conscience does, and here's on the positive side, it rewards you when you've done right. When that alarm goes off and you don't take that sandwich and somebody comes in, you don't know whose sandwich it was, and somebody comes in and they go, okay, great, my sandwich. They say, you know, I don't usually eat this, but last night I made this and they talk about this sandwich and how special it is, whatever. And you feel good inside because you exercise self-control, you obeyed your conscience, and even if no one else knows, that's your conscience patting you on the back 
God has put that in us. Um, I, I was very helped by this, by this idea. Some of you know Jeff Smith. He's a ruling elder in our, our presbytery. And he did a whole Sunday school lesson up at Redeemer, our mother church on the conscience, and even put a lot of this stuff down on, on, on paper. I think he should get it published as a, as a book. And it just transformed my life or, or the, the conscience. And, and knowing what that is, when I see something that I shouldn't do and I hear that beeping go off inside of me, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that. And, and getting in that practice of, uh, of, not, uh, uh, of not going ahead and doing that because I know those guilt, that conscience in me will make me feel guilty afterward. Or if I obey, I'll feel good inside. And so that's what we're going to talk in two, two through four here. So having it to number two, um, having a clear conscience is important. For a couple of reasons. Having a clear conscience is important in part because when you're accused of doing wrong, that's your blank, when you're accused of doing wrong, you're having done what is good glorifies Christ. If you're accused of, what, of doing wrong, that thing will get examined and you'll be exonerated. And you'll be shown as a person with great self-control and Christ will be honored by that self-control, by that lack of sin by that Christ-likeness that you exhibited in being righteous and faithful to the Lord and loving other people and loving God through doing what was right and doing what was good. So having a clear conscience is important in part because when you're accused of doing wrong, you're having done what is good glorifies Christ and may even bring others seeing your conduct to faith. You're obeying your conscience. You're keeping a clear conscience may end up bringing somebody to faith. We talked about this a while ago when we were in the, the first half of 1 Peter 2. Um, that is, you see this in, in verse uh, 16 here in, in chapter uh, 13, or chapter 3, sorry. Um, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good, be good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. You know, if I'm a non-believer and I, I accuse you of wrongdoing uh, and you've just done right, and then I either realize, you know, I'm just lying here, or it's proven that you have done right, that may make me feel bad enough that it starts something going spiritually inside of me as a non-believer. And, and then look up at chapter 2, verse 12, to emphasize this even more. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. In other words, when Jesus comes back, when God visits us, that person, because he has seen your good life, though he's even accused you of doing wrong, he ultimately saw your good deeds. And that was part of what God used to bring him to faith in Jesus. Uh, likewise, verse 15 uh, of chapter 2, 1 Peter 2, 15. For it is God's will that by doing good you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish men. Jesus says the same thing in, in the Sermon on the Mount in chapter 5, that uh, those he, that were salt to the earth were light to the world, and by doing good deeds, by doing good works, those pe people around us may see those good works and glorify our Father in heaven. So you're keeping a clear conscience is important because it glorifies Christ and it reflects him and it may bring somebody else to faith in Jesus, which further glorifies Christ. Then there'll be another person out there as an object of his or her life glorifying Christ by what he does and says. So keeping a good conscience is, a, is an important thing uh, for you. Number three, when you heed, heed, H-E-E-D, when you heed the warnings of your conscience, it will be clear, as we spoke about before, it will make you feel good and it will make you feel satisfied of soul. When there was something that was wrong that would have been easy for you to do, maybe something where you could have done that was wrong and you would have got pats on the back from the people around you for doing what was wrong, uh, and, and you would have been included in the group if you did what was wrong, but, but you don't do that. And, and you, you hold the line and you do what's good and right. Then 
You're satisfied of soul. You're encouraged. You've done what you were created to do, what's good and right, and that makes you feel whole inside. Not conflicted with a guilty conscience, but you've got your conscience patting you on the back, saying, you know, way to go, way to go. So when you heed the warnings of your conscience, it'll be clear and you'll feel good and satisfied of soul. And then four, thus to glorify Jesus, to be like him, to feel good in your soul, be motivated. Be motivated to have a clear conscience. Live your life like this. Be motivated to, to go through your day with a good conscience, with, with being able to be asked any question by anybody and to give a truthful answer that's not embarrassing. Be motivated in that way. It's, it's the way to go. It really is. It's the way to live. Uh, we have that funny expression, you know, when something goes right, right for us, we say, yep, it's all that good living. <laughs> right? But on the soul level, we feel good on the, in, on the inside when we obey our conscience. When we hear that alarm go off and say, don't step through this. Don't do this bad deed. Don't do what's wrong. And we obey our conscience and we say, okay, I hear that alarm. And we do what's right and we do what's good. Our conscience pats us on the back and we don't have any worry. We talked about in, in uh, 1 Peter 2, uh, 13 through 17, when we had about four or five weeks on authorities. You know, our government authorities have said there's a certain speed that you can go on each road. And if you go that certain speed or less, guess what happens when you pass a state highway patrolman? You don't feel guilty. If you got that cruise control set on 55 and it's 55 miles per hour, you don't even have to check. You don't have to say, oh, what speed am I going? And you don't have that rush of adrenaline go through your body and, and, and cause your heart to jump. Okay? Um, this is, you know, don't, do what's good. Do what's right, um, and, and, and that's good. That's good for your soul. Um, you, you know, I remember watching Law and Order back uh, probably in about 1996, and one of the main characters, played by Benjamin Bratt, had uh, committed adultery against his wife. Just a one day, one day thing. At the, the last episode of the last season of 1996, and the, the new season in '96 started up, and his his partner uh, Lenny. Um, who, who is the voice for um, the candlestick on, on uh, Beauty and the Beast, um, says, what's going on? You're eating all these roll uh to Benjamin Bratt. And it's just he's worried. He's just scared to death he's going to be found out uh, by his wife, and, and he is. But be motivated to have a clear conscience. It's a great, it's a great way to live. Uh, Jesus lived his life with a clear conscience. Um, Live your life with a clear conscience, you'll feel better inside. Okay, so that's the first thing. Keep your conscience clear. Be motivated. How do I do what's good even though I'm going to suffer for it? Well, okay, I may suffer for it, but I'm going to feel good on the inside if I obey my conscience, if I keep my conscience clear. I'm going to uh, glorify Jesus if I keep my conscience clear. So keep that in mind. Second thing, second help to doing what's good even though you may suffer for it. By fearing God. By fearing God and his fatherly discipline more than you fear man's harm. By fearing God and his fatherly discipline more than you fear man's harm. Uh, verse 14. Look at that. Chapter 3, verse 14. Right after saying, um, be eager to do good and you may suffer for doing what's right. He says this, do not fear what they fear. Do not be frightened. In other words, don't fear the harm that man may bring you for doing what's good. Don't fear what they fear. Um, in life, uh, when you were a teenager and you decided you wouldn't study and you'd just get D's and you'd start hanging around with the guys who, with the guys who did drugs and if your parents didn't do anything, they didn't discipline you. If there were no consequences for that, they weren't loving parents, God says, in that sense, in Hebrews 12. 
Hebrews 12 says, God is a good father. And if you're his son, he disciplines you because he loves you. He wants to lead you in a path where he can bless you. He doesn't want you to be living in a, in a path where he has to discipline you. And he will discipline you because he loves you. It's so like my, my dad used to say, John, I know everybody else gets to do that. But not you, because I love you. I know everybody else gets to act like that. But not you, because I love you. Don't act like that. No one's admiring you when you act like that, even though your friends may approve. And that's the way the Lord is. He's committed to us as a loving father, and he wants us to have a life that, where he's just freely blessing us. And he has no cause to, to discipline us so that we might learn to walk in his ways. We see that in the Old Testament. We see that in the New Testament. And, and the writer of Hebrews gives us this argument. Just well, be like Jesus, who goes to the cross knowing it'll be shame to him because he trusts his Father's ways are right. Don't walk into unrighteousness and then put God in the position where, okay, I need to discipline John now so that he'll learn to walk in a way where he'll experience the, the fruitful uh, the, the, the peace of uh, uh, fruitful or a fruit of peace, which comes from righteousness, however he puts it there in Hebrews chapter 12. Okay? So God wants you to live like you were created to live and just to bless you. And he wants you in your life, when wrong is before you, to say, you know what? I'd rather just God bless me instead of him disciplining me. And he wants you to, to fear that discipline. He punishes those who are his sons because he cares for them. That's what Hebrews 12 says. Now, it's not punishment to hell. No, we're, we're, our, our, our salvation is based on our faith in Jesus. But he cares about us enough that he disciplines us when we do what's wrong. So realize when you see the option of doing bad before you, that as a son or daughter of God, that God will discipline you if you cross that line. And he says... So don't fear what they fear. Don't fear the reprisals of man. Uh, we call this peer pressure. Okay? Don't, don't falter to peer pressure. Don't, don't fear people making fun of you. Don't fear consequences of doing what's good. Jesus says in, in Luke 12, 5, I'll tell you who you should fear. Not man who gives you temporary pain. But fear the one who, after uh, throwing, uh, after uh, harm is done to your body, can throw your soul in hell as well. Fear God. That's who you should fear. And we should fear the discipline of God coming to us, his fatherly discipline. Jesus is our example in this. Um, he's our example of fearing the fatherly discipline, rather and rather looking to his blessing. Jesus doesn't heed the advice of Peter in Matthew 16. Peter says, well, you know, if you're going to be rejected by men in Jerusalem, you shouldn't go. Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. You're thinking the thoughts of man, not of God. Jesus doesn't fear what men fear. Other men besides Jesus, Jesus' own disciples, feared going to Jerusalem and getting turned over to the authorities and being killed. But Jesus feared, he revered his father. And so he goes to Jerusalem anyway. Jesus doesn't fear going before Pilate in the Sanhedrin. He tells Peter later in the Garden of Gethsemane to put his knife away or his sword away. Um, he says, shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? Shall I not go through the harm man has for me in Jerusalem to do the will of God? And so we, like Jesus, we do the will of God. We do what's good, knowing that harm may come to us. And Jesus is our example of this. See, third thing, third help. 
So we, first of all, keep a clear conscience. We think about God's fatherly discipline and not wanting to be in that, and rather to be in his blessing. And saying, you know, fear of man is nothing. I'd rather, I, I'd rather uh, uh, be in my father's blessing. Third thing, see, the third way God is letting you uh, know here to do good in the face of potential suffering caused by it is by this, by vigilantly setting apart Christ as Lord in your heart. By vigilantly setting apart Christ as Lord in your heart. Um, Lord in your heart. Here's what that means. Uh, Lord, th think of this in lowercase. Okay, some most of the time we think when we're in, you know, in the church, Lord is, is uppercase L. Uh, I, I want you to think of, of Lord in lowercase L for a little bit to get the meaning of what this is. Your Lord is the one who tells you what to do. He's, you know, the boss. Okay? Jesus as Lord of your heart. As the one who's ruling. This is not so much a Lord of divinity as much as a Lord of mastership. Jesus as your master. He's my king. He's my Lord. He's my ruler. He's the one who determines what I do and what I don't do. And so you see here in this passage, look down there, verse 15, the first part of it, but in your, Christ, in your heart set apart Christ as Lord. You know, the ver we talk about this in Sunday school. The, the chapters and verses came around in the 1100s or the 1200s. They're not God-inspired. The words are God-inspired, but the chapters and verses came around in the 80, 1100s or 1200s. It, it, it would be better to put the, the 15 in front of the always. Because you see that, but it's connected to what comes before. Do not fear what they fear, the end of chapter 14, but in your heart set apart Christ as Lord. Don't fear the reprisals of men, but set up Christ as the one who's going to rule what you do. Don't be ruled by fear of men. Be ruled by Jesus. Don't have fear of men be your Lord. Have Jesus be your Lord. So, vigilantly set apart Christ as Lord in your heart, um, such that, that's your next line there, such that he is ruler of all your actions. That's what this means. Set apart Christ as Lord in your heart. Do good, even if you're going to suffer for it. And here's how you do that. By setting apart Christ as ruler of your heart. Now, you may need to, when you, you go into a room or, or you're in a situation, a classroom or at work or talking to a neighbor, that before you walk into that room or before you start engaging with that neighbor, that you say in your own head, Jesus, you're my ruler here. And my responses, my actions, they need to be ruled by you. Help me to do that. Help me to respond quickly in a way that would be good and right even if that response may mean I suffer or get made fun of. Because when we're not prepared, when we don't have Christ set apart as Lord in our heart, we find ourselves in situations and our guard is down and we just kind of go with the flow and before we know it, we've submitted to fear of man as our ruler, as the ruler or the Lord of our heart. Okay, so that's a third way. Set apart Christ as Lord of your heart or ruler of your heart to rule all your words, your actions as you interact with people in the world. And then D, uh, how do we do this? How do we do what's good? By being raised up by the Spirit and putting to death, putting to death the deeds of your old nature of sin. By being raised up by the Spirit, by putting to death the deeds of your old nature of sin, the things you used to do before you knew Christ. The pattern for this is with Jesus' physical death on the cross. Jesus is put to death, bearing our sins. Look at verse 18. Okay, here's the pattern. And again, this is not just an arbitrary, let's put the gospel up there in the middle of this passage about doing good and suffering for it. No, it's showing us how do we do good? We do good by putting to death the deeds of our former nature, putting to death sins. When sins come up before us and say, 
do this, do this, do this, do this sin, do that sin, do this other sin. We put it to death. We say, no, we take a sword and we, we slay it. Just like Jesus in his going on the cross took our sins and killed them. He put them to death as he died. They were in his body. But then in his resurrection, he was raised to life. And we're to do that in our lives. Our lives are to be a reenactment of this. When sin becomes before us, when something comes before us that we would have done in our sin nature and that our sin nature still wants to do, we slay it. We put it to death. We say, no, I need to put that to death. And I need to rise up instead and follow the Spirit of God who's calling me to obey the commands of Scripture, to do the Lord's will. And so Colossians 3.5 was read to us this morning by Carl. Colossians 3.5, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. Jesus put to death our sins. So get with the program. This is what Paul says. Give it the prayer. Jesus put to death our sins on the cross. You put to death your sins in your life as temptation comes before for you. Or as Carl read from Romans 8, 12. Therefore, brothers, we have an obligation, but it is not to the sinful nature to live according to it. We're not obliged to live according to the sin nature. But, verse 13 of Romans 8, for if you live according to the sinful nature, you'll die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body you will live. This is describing the Christian life. We're people who are putting to death as the misdeeds are coming before us, saying, do me, do me, do me. All these misdeeds coming before us saying, do this. We put those deeds to death. And we say, no, I don't live to that deed anymore. I used to, but you're not my boss. You're not my master. I am no longer a slave to you. I put you to death. You have no sway over me. If somebody's your boss and that boss dies, you don't have to obey him anymore. He's dead. And that's the picture scripture gives to us. Or Galatians 5.16, Paul says, So I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. And in verse 25 of Galatians 5, Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. So in your life, live by the Spirit, follow the Spirit, keep in step with the Spirit. And when the misdeeds of the body, the misdeeds of your old, dead, spiritually dead nature come before you, put them to death. Slay them. Don't do them. So that's it. Four things. How you can do this, do good in spite of the fact that you know you may suffer for it. Uh, One is keep a clear conscience. Two, fear God's fatherly discipline. He loves you and he's going to bring it to you if you do those misdeeds of the body, if you do misdeeds of the sinful nature. Third thing, keep Christ as Lord of your heart. Have him rule your actions and your words and be vigilant. Set him apart as Lord of your heart. And then D, follow the Spirit and what he's inspired. That is his commands. Follow his Spirit and put to death the deeds of the body. Just as Jesus Followed the Spirit. He was resurrected in the Spirit. And he was put to death, burying our sins. Now three, three, number three, aftermath. When you do good and you suffer for it, um, what happens and what do you do? So three, aftermath. When asked about your good conduct, that's your blank. When asked about your good conduct, especially in the face of getting treated badly for so doing, A, speak of Jesus. When asked about your good conduct, especially when you've been treated badly because you've done good conduct, speak of Jesus. When asked, why did you do that? Why didn't didn't you know you'd get made fun of? Didn't you know those guys would laugh at you? Didn't you know you'd be excluded from the group by doing that? Didn't you know you'd lose your job? Speak of Jesus. Speak of Jesus. Uh, Because as you uh, speak of Jesus... um, You bring glory to him. But know this. Don't speak, and here's your second blank there. Don't speak about yourself. Okay, Speak of Jesus, not yourself. When you're asked about why did you do that, that good thing, 
Didn't you know that this would happen? Why did you do that? Speak of Jesus, not yourself. The Pharisee speaks of himself. Well, because I'm righteous, and I do what's good, and I think that other thing's wrong. That's what the Pharisees did. Okay? And we're not to, we're not to be like that. Okay? Speak of Jesus, not, your, not yourself. Uh, verse 16. Look at verse 16, chapter 3. Keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. Um, it is, sorry, verse 15. Um, in your hearts, set Christ apart as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have. Jesus is the reason for the hope that you have. Jesus is the reason that you act differently. So that's what you're to be prepared to do. To give a response for the hope that's in you. To explain your actions of doing good in the face of suffering for it with the answer of Jesus. Not the answer of yourself. You're not your hope for eternal life. You're not hoping you have eternal life because you're a good person. You're hoping in eternal life because Jesus has borne your sins in his body on a cross. So be ready. Number one, so number one there, speak of the hope of eternal life that you have from Jesus. Speak of the hope of eternal life you have from Jesus and how that hope makes you live differently. I talked to you at the beginning about Scott Everhart, my friend. Um, he had a hope of what would be in the future, and that made him live differently made him practice basketball um, for a good part of the day, every summer day. And our hope directs us to live our lives differently too. So we can say something like, my hope is to be with Jesus in heaven, and there only good will be done. And so I'm living according to that today. Jesus has given me hope of eternal life, and he wants me to live differently. Speak of Jesus. Speak of Jesus. Um, or number two, you can say, Jesus has given me the number one there um, from Jesus. I hope it, did you get both of those blanks there? Okay, good. So number two, you can say, Jesus has given me eternal life. Jesus has given me eternal life, and he wants me to act in a certain way in my life now. Doing good, even if I might get made fun of for it. So we say, Jesus, well, why'd you do that? Well, Jesus has given me eternal life, and he wants me to act in a certain way in my life now, even though I may get made fun of for it. Speak of Jesus. Put the attention on him. Use it as an opportunity not to talk about you and your endurance and your long-suffering or your whatever. Use it as an opportunity to talk about Jesus. Jesus has given me the hope of eternal life, and he wants me to live a different life today. He wants me to do good, so I try to do that. Okay. B. B. How do you say this? As you're talking to somebody else and says, why did you do that? Why did you do good, even though you knew you were going to get pounded for it? Um, do not speak like most Christians, or perhaps I should have thought about this this morning, like most in the church, like most in the church um, today do. Um, don't speak like most Christians do today or most people who are in the church do today with pomposity, it's being pompous. Second blank, with condemnation. So with pomposity, condemnation, and disdain. Okay, we don't want to speak to people when they when they ask us, why, why did you do that? Why did you do that thing where you knew you were going to get pummeled for that? Don't be pompous. Don't be condemnatory. And don't be disdaining of those who act differently than you. Don't be disdaining of the people who have made fun of you or have brought suffering upon you. Um, take a look at Luke 18. Go ahead and turn there. Luke 18. It's page 742.
So we do good in this life because we have a hope of eternal life. In our eternal life, when we're with Jesus, only good will be done. And so we get practice, we start practicing that now. We do what's, we do what's good as, as, as much as we can do it. But we don't speak about ourselves. We don't speak with, with arrogance uh, toward those who don't have God's spirit. We don't draw attention to ourselves. We draw attention to the hope we have within us because of Jesus. So Luke 18, verse 9. To some who are confident of their own righteousness and look down on everybody else. You know, how many church people does this describe, right? They look down on everybody else. Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other men, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. That's his response of why are you doing good? Well, because I'm not like everybody else. I give a tenth of all I make. And I do this and I do that and I do this other thing and I'm better than other people who don't. Pomposity, condemnation, and disdain. That's what the Pharisees thought religion was about. And that's what most people in churches think religion's about. It's a way for me to ex distinguish myself from other people who aren't in the church so that I can say how great I am and how awful everybody else is. And that person does not understand the gospel. When we understand the gospel, we see we're the second guy. The second guy comes, verse 13, but the tax collector stood at a distance he would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. So when we're asked, why did we do this good thing? Don't exalt yourself. Answer that with humility and exalt Jesus. Say, Jesus has given me the hope of eternal life, and he asked me to live in a way where I, I should be doing good to other people. Um, so that's why Jesus, Jesus said so. Jesus told me. So rather, your last line there, speak like Jesus, who's gentle and humble in heart, Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29. And he speaks with gentleness even when harmed unto death on a cross, saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. Jesus up on the cross doesn't say, you sinful people out there, don't you know how much better I am than you? You should be up here, not me. That's not how Jesus speaks. Jesus, with gentleness, with humility, says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. So speak like Jesus with, here are your blanks, gentleness and respect. Verse 15, verse 15, look at 1 Peter 3, 15. But in your heart set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason, the reason for the hope that you have. That's the content. But do this with gentleness and respect. Gentleness toward those who ask. Respect for them, not disdain, not condemnation. That's the gospel. Jesus has given us hope of eternal life. Jesus has done good to us, so we do good to others. Let's pray.